Should the United States continue to police the world? This is an argument we've all heard a thousand times, but the real argument, the one that nobody in the media will discuss, is that we are not the world's police. And through this short video, I'm going to outline just why that is. I'm going to show you the facts, the things that you've never heard from the mainstream media, and you never will. By the end of this video, I only hope that I have opened your eyes in some minor way to the issues we have within our government and the way it conducts itself. Now let me be very clear. The key to actually taking something away from this video will be to forget all of your political affiliations. Let me also make clear that I am not condemning our military in any way throughout this video. I wholeheartedly support our fighting men and women, and I solely condemn our corrupt leaders who send them to do their bidding by telling them they're helping the world. We gained this title of World Police through our actions of the early 20th century, particularly from the World Wars and Korea. People around the world began to count on us to save them from tyranny. Today, however, we see a growing trend that the United States is not intervening in places where evil is pervasive, but rather where it is in the monetary interests of our government. Towards the end of World War II in 1944, the Bretton Woods Agreements established a gold standard for the world, where countries would sell their gold to the United States in exchange for U.S. dollars. Under this system, no country's value could be over or understated because it was based in solid gold. However, in 1970, the problem started. Seeing how much we were spending on the war in Vietnam, countries holding dollars began to speculate that the United States was spending more than it had in gold. In other words, we were printing extra money. You see, the agreements relied on the assumption that the U.S. Federal Reserve would never print more money than there was gold to back, but the Fed was held to this by nothing more than the honors system. So when the speculators began to ask for their gold back, President Nixon had I this I directed system. Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. After Nixon ended the gold standard, the dollar was in need of other backing in order to preserve its value. So, in 1973, President Nixon traveled to Saudi Arabia and met with King Faisal. He proposed a plan. You agree to sell your oil in U.S. dollars and purchase U.S. Treasury bonds with your excess profits, and the United States military will give you the full protection of your oil fields. King Faisal agreed, as did nearly every member of OPEC, the oil-producing and exporting countries. This was the birth of the so-called petrodollar, a U.S. dollar backed by the sale of oil. From 1973 on, any country who wanted oil would have to purchase it with dollars. And how would they get those dollars? By selling goods and services to the United States. Every country would have to do business with the United States in order to be able to continue purchasing oil. This is key, folks. As long as the oil around the world is sold in dollars, the dollar has value. But because we produce virtually nothing in this country anymore, oil sales and our military power are the only things supporting the dollar. Fast forward to 1990. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, whom the United States has agreed to protect under the agreements of 1973. Troops are sent, Saddam is pushed back, and all is well. The press tried to play this off as a humanitarian effort to protect the Kuwaiti people, but everyone knew it was about the oil fields. Another 10 years goes by and something interesting happens. In 2000, Saddam announced that he'd be switching oil sales from the dollar to the euro. At this time, the euro was weaker, so Saddam was losing a substantial amount of money by doing this. It didn't take long for Washington to find out about Saddam's switch, and an alarm went off. See, the fear was, and still is, that if one country was allowed to switch their oil sales from the dollar to an alternative currency, what would stop everyone else? A message needed to be sent. The media immediately began a campaign of shining a spotlight on Saddam's cruel dictatorship and his weapons of mass destruction in an effort to drum up support for an invasion. But the people didn't want to go to war. So you're confident that it's going to go our way? Well, it will go our way. And then the morning of September 11, 2001 came, and everything changed. If you look at the evidence, it's clear that we haven't been told the whole story about what happened that day. But that's a whole different can of worms. Regardless, the timing was right, and the American people wanted Saddam bombed off the face of the planet. So Bush kicked off the invasion of Iraq, and in April of 2003, Baghdad was taken. By the beginning of June, a pro-Western government was installed, and a very quiet policy change was announced. Iraq would be switching back to the dollar for its oil sales. At the time, the euro had surpassed the dollar, so Iraq was again losing money on the deal. Fast forward again to 2011. The United States government had been promoting Libya as a model for the Middle East and an important ally. Suddenly, though, the Libya rhetoric in the media changed to highlighting Gaddafi as a vicious murderer and a cruel dictator who needed to be stopped. 
So why the sudden change? Did Gaddafi just snap one day and start murdering his people? Of course not. However, in 2011, he announced his plans to gather an alliance of Middle Eastern oil producers and create a gold currency called the dinar, which they would then all sell their oil in, leaving the dollar behind. It didn't take long for Obama to make the announcement, the bombs to drop, Gaddafi to be dragged into the street and shot, and the dinar plan to fade into the abyss. Now we come to Iran. Iran hasn't been our best friend since the 1950s when the CIA organized a coup which destroyed the closest thing the Iranians ever had to a democracy. So due to their distrust for us ever since, Iran is one of the last countries to sell their oil exclusively in gold. And who are their biggest customers? Our biggest enemies, China and Russia. Additionally, in 2010, Iran, Syria, and Iraq announced a plan for a natural gas pipeline that would deliver Iranian natural gas directly from the South Pars oil field in Iran to the market in Europe without ever passing through any Western middlemen. This puts Iran in the center of the U.S. government's crosshairs. But instead of invading, we've been using the pretense of stopping their nuke program to impose sanctions on Iran to cripple their economy. Primarily, Obama stopped all flow of oil out of the country and all gold into it. Ultimately, our government needs a pro-Western regime in Iran. But the problem is that Iran has one major ally in the region that stands in the way. Can anyone guess who it is? It's Syria. Syria and Iran are bound by mutual protection agreements, so if one is attacked, the other one defends it. Syria also has the largest military force in the region. This means that to get to Iran, Syria has to go. July 2013, suddenly every news channel in the country is focused on the Assad regime in Syria and the brewing civil war. As the old saying goes, You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. The Obama administration began pumping in millions of dollars to the al-Qaeda-linked opposition fighters, as well as training them with the CIA. The media in the U.S. ramped up the coverage of Syria, trying to drum up support for the military intervention, and just like in 2000, the people weren't having it. Then, on August 21st, the Damascus suburb was gassed, killing a large number of women and children. Obama immediately jumped on TV. The situation profoundly changed, though, when Assad's government gassed to death over a thousand people. We now know that this was a flat-out lie. What we weren't shown is that there was actually no substantial evidence to blame Assad for the attack. In fact, the evidence pointed to the U.S.-funded rebels. I simply don't have time to cover the evidence, but please research it on your own. Several different credible investigative reports were produced that showed the evidence, but none of it was published or talked about in the mainstream media. The American people didn't bite the hook this time, though. And luckily, we had a few good people in the Joint Chiefs and in Congress that were able to stop this lie from leading us to World War III. So here's how the system works. You believe the government wants to help people around the world, so that's what they tell you they're doing. And the media is their most powerful weapon. They capitalize on crises to influence regime change and secure their interests. If they can't get the support they need from you, they trick you into supporting them through falsely blamed attacks. Meanwhile, millions of people who are wondering when the world police are coming to save them are slaughtered in African genocides, which started with UN gun confiscations, but you don't hear anything about that in the media. My point is this. People need to remember how to think critically, instead of taking everything that comes out of the media as gospel. Start doing your own research, read the credible alternative media, and find out the facts for yourself. This is the only way that we will ever hold these people responsible.